And uh, so I really actually welcome the opportunity today to uh, talk with, uh, with Canadian media because I think it'll help organize it in my own head. Uh, just the, the huge variety of the experience. Uh, on the space station, when you have 30 seconds free, you go do something else because there's just so many things to do. It's just such a, a rich, challenging environment right on the edge of the human experience. And uh, I am so proud of the team of people that make it possible. Uh, first and foremost, the crew that I flew with. What great humans. Uh, but, but the people at the Canadian Space Agency, they've been working day and night for years to make this happen. And, uh, and it is such a pleasure, even though virtually, to be back with some of them today. Um, and I'm looking forward to coming back and visiting there as soon as uh, my rehabilitation and, and the initial medical testing is complete. Well, uh, it's very confusing for my body right now uh, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, of course, is just gravity. Without the constant pull down of gravity, your body gets a whole new normal. And my body was quite happy living in space without gravity. A very um, uh, empowering environment where you can touch the wall and do somersaults, where you can move a refrigerator around with your fingertips and and never worrying about which way was up. Well, all that suddenly changed when our Soyuz slammed back into the Earth and my body is, is, uh, is catching Everyone up is with the change. Up. And hey, so the, the symptoms are uh, Three, dizziness. Uh, as, it's sort of like when you come off a ride at the, uh, at the C&E or, or something and you're your inner ear and your eyes are telling you different things. So I have dizziness. Um, also, my body is not really remembered very well how to get the blood back up to my head. And so underneath my clothing, I've been wearing a, a G suit to, to sort of like holding the bottom of a balloon to squeeze the blood up into my head. Um, and I haven't held my head up for five months. And so my neck is sore and my back is sore. You know, it's just, it, uh, it feels like I, I played a hard game of rugby yesterday or or, or played full contact hockey yesterday and I haven't played in a while. My body's just sore and I'm dizzy, but it's, it's getting better measurably by the hour. And uh, I, I was talking to, uh, to my flight surgeon and folks here. It does feel, I think, like maybe, and Tom Marshburn, he's my crewmate. He and I are sort of tottering around like two old duffers in an old folks home. Uh, and it did recur to me, we just look like, like maybe we're gonna look 30 years from now as we go from the rocking chair to the, uh, to the comfy, couch, but, but we're recovering. But something to remember, and sorry it's a long answer, but uh, it's a really good laboratory to study. And we have medical researchers from Canada here looking exactly at that because the symptoms are so much like aging. My blood vessels have hardened. My uh, cardiovascular system has changed. How my blood regulates blood pressure. All those things have changed rapidly, and now they're readapting. And so we have researchers here that are looking at how does the body actually control those things? It's a, I'm a lab rat, but I'm a full-size human lab rat, and there's no other way to make this transition happen on Earth. It's just a gift of weightlessness. And so um, researchers like from the University of Waterloo, Dr. Richard Hewson that's down here, have, are pro, poke, have poking and prodding me, but gaining a lot of insight and understanding about the human body directly as a result of the fact that I'm tottering around a little bit. It's very uh, different being or orbiting the world uh, in that uh, we have quite good connectivity, as you could probably see by, uh, by the ability f to communicate using social media, be able to send down pictures and tweet and, and get feedback. So I felt connected, uh, at least technologically. But each day is incredibly busy. When I said at the outset that if you have 30 seconds, you don't wait for 30 seconds to pass and, and just sit there and twiddle your thumbs. You go and do something. You go to the window. You, you go and get one of your task list items done. You kick off something in your own list of something you wanted to try while you're up there. So Rudyard Kipling's poem of, you know, fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, it's six months of that, you know, where you are just filling the unforgiving minute. So yes, I understood. The, um, the fact that there was a growing interest um, and following for what was happening. But I just, it's not my purpose. The purpose is to help people to understand what is possible on the space station and the things that we're doing. I mean, while we were up there, the alpha magnetic spectrometer up on the top is collecting dark matter and dark energy from the universe. And a Nobel laureate started talking about uh, some of the, the new things we're learning about the fundamental nature of matter and that only exists because of the space station. 
um, microflow did, I did all the first testing on this great new Canadian invention, which uh, is has applications all over Canada, especially in our remote communities. That happens on board. Um, the number of students that we directly engaged in um, in the Let Talk, Let's Talk Science program, uh, I think it was like 7,000 students across Canada that were doing the same experiments on Earth that I was doing in orbit. All that stuff weaves together, and, and they feed on each other. And if a million, I, I'm just coming up in a million people that follow me on Twitter, but uh, they follow me because it's interesting, because it's not just one thing. There was beautiful imagery. There's, um, there's poetry in what's happening. There's purpose in what's happening. There's, there's a beauty to it. There's hope in it. And it's an international thing. These, in the song that Ed Robertson and I wrote, we talked about 15 nations that was once ruled by fear. Um, when you look at the nations that, that are building and maintaining the International Space Station, it's, I mean, I was a cold warrior uh, intercepting Soviet bombers in the 80s. And, and now, look where we are. This, this space station is, is a wonderful example of how people can do things right. And uh, the more interest in it, the, not so much interest, the more understanding that, that comes from it, I think, uh, the better we all are. And I'm very delighted that the way that we attacked it and tried to present it as a full cornucopia, that so many people are interested and that uh, and it gives us much more of a, of a platform to talk about all of the wonderful things that are happening up there. Well, I, I owe a tremendous debt to all of the, uh, the pioneers that have gone before. And, and it's easy to say that, but it is the truth. And luckily enough, um, I, I was president of the Association of Space Explorers for three years, which is our astronaut and cosmonaut professional society. And so I know all the astronauts and cosmonauts, and, and I know Buzz, and, um, and, and, and Alexei Leonov is a good friend of mine, the first human being to do a spacewalk, a wonderful, capable human and a real gentleman. And um, those guys had it a lot harder because they had no one to ask. They had no, um, no experience to draw on. And, you know, when Buzz and Neil and Mike went to the moon in 69, they'd only been astronauts for a few years. You know, they were at about the same level of experience, or maybe slightly more, that David and Jeremy have right now. And then th when they came back, it was a life of ticker tape parades for them after that. It was, it was such a schism in their existence that I don't know how they could possibly have rationalized their former life and their, and their afterlife. Um, it's different now. Uh, I've been an astronaut for 21 years. Uh, I know those people, and I've picked their brains about, you know, what went right and what went wrong. And... And I've flown in space twice before. I've been the director of operations in Russia for NASA. All these different jobs, seeing welcoming crews and helping them out of the capsule and putting people onto rocket ships and launching them. Uh, one of the astronauts, his, uh, his mom was killed in a car crash while I was in orbit. I was taking care of his family. And so I got to see the entire spectrum of all the things that can happen. And, and then also how all the astronauts deal with it when they return home. And so all of that, and of course, we have a wonderful psychological support staff, the Canadian Space Agency, the people that have been keeping me mentally, uh, can you say mentally lighthearted, um, that have been keeping me happy and healthy uh, throughout the mission. But of course, we've talked all about how is this going to fit into life, you know, and how can we make the most of this step? And I've already flown in space twice. I, I don't spend my life going, gosh, I went to Mir in 1995 and now everything else is boring. That's not how I've ever felt. You know, I, I take just as much pride in the, uh, the great big dock that my neighbor Bob and I built at our cottage as I do in, um, in building Canada Arm 2 on the space station. Those were both very complex projects, required a lot of physical effort, planning, real-time decision-making, and the product is out there for everybody to see. And I, I feel really good about them both. And I, I am not a person who looks backwards and wishes that, that the past was my present. Uh, and so I... Um, I uh, I don't think I, I'm going to feel the way that Buzz did.